Hello, welcome everybody. Um, welcome to our webinar today, which is hosted by Regenerous Laboratories. The subject for today is food intolerance testing and intestinal permeability. And I'm really excited to be able to welcome Dr. Joel Evans who you see here before you. So Dr. Evans is a board certified obstetrician and gynecologist and a hugely popular international, international lecturer and is also the director for the Center of Functional Medicine in Stamford, Connecticut, as well as being the medical director for KBMO Diagnostics, whose food intolerance test we're going to be delving into today. His work with KBMO allows Dr. Evans to help physicians and nutritional therapists understand the importance of the relationship of food sensitivities to health and disease. He's a member of, um, of the senior faculty of two of the most recognized and prestigious teaching institutions in, in, in integrative medicine, which is the Institute for Functional Medicine and the Center for Mind-Body Medicine. And he continues to serve as the external leader of the IFM Advanced Practice Module in Hormone Health since its inception in 2011, which incidentally I was at. Um, and for those of you in the UK, you'll also um, know Dr. Evans from um, AFMCP because he's on the, the UK faculty for AFMCP and you do gut health at AFMCP. Yes, right. yes. So Dr. Evans also serves as a peer reviewer for the journal um, Alternative Therapies in Health and Medicine and Global Advances in Health and Medicine, and is a member of the Editorial Advisory Board of Holistic Primary Care. Um, he is the founding diplomate of the American Board of Holistic Medicine and is recognized as the first physician in Connecticut to be board certified in both integrative medicine and obstetrics and gynecology, which is quite a, um, an accolade, I think. Dr. Evans in his clinical practice has a special in interest in breast cancer and as the medical director of the Keeper Breast Foundation brings the latest information on cancer risk assessment and prevention to his patients and I think that that's actually really relevant to what we're going to be talking it about. It is, today. it is. And as well as all of that and there's actually way more, <laughs> <laughs> I had to keep it to one page. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, Dr. Evans has also pursued studies in spirituality, metaphysics, and personal transformation for many years, and has recently created a core curriculum designed to share ancient spiritual wisdom with others to help bring health and happiness into their lives. So you are very much a full spectrum physician. Yes, yes. You cover all of the integrated, yeah. conventional, holistic. Yes, yes, yes. But I'll tell you, as good as it sounds on paper, what's what I really love doing is this, yeah. which is educating people. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that really comes across. You know, you are a fantastic educator, and it's clearly um, it's clearly what sets you on fire. I think. That, that yes. Comes so we are, of course, going to be talking about food intolerance testing today and all of the different um, uh, aspects to that. But before we dive into that, I've got two important questions for you. Um, the first is, could you tell us a little bit more about how you became a doctor in the first place originally and your conventional um, uh, pathway? And then how did you come to functional medicine from conventional medicine? Because I learned from you that there's always a story um, <laughs> about how that bridge occurred. Yes, there is always a story. So what's so interesting is I, from my earliest childhood memories, I knew I was going to be a doctor. Yeah. And that sort of showed itself to me when I was sort of doing my solo play. It was always about role playing as a, you know, a, as a doctor or brain surgeon or whatever. And uh, then I became interested in sort of how I could help others in high school, right? How could I take this interest in medicine and do something in high school? So I learned about first aid courses and became certified with that. I became a lifeguard. I ended up working on an ambulance, becoming an emergency medical technician, and knew very early on that this was it. And so I applied to six-year medical programs and straight out of high school went to medical school. And... Uh, you know, it was a lot of hard work. I loved it, fast-tracked, uh, knew I loved delivering babies, 
and I felt like I was in my element in the delivery room and went on to uh, become an OBGYN in Connecticut in a very prestigious practice and had an exp you know, experiences early on that taught me that even though I was a product of very, very highly regarded teaching and training institutions, there were things I just wasn't taught. And I sort of had this egotistical expectation that if I didn't know about it, it wasn't important. And it was these patients that taught me that that was not the case. So I had one patient who was 26 years old that I diagnosed with breast cancer. And, you know, the first thing that we're taught about breast cancer is that it's painless. And she came in with a breast lump that was very painful. And so I really didn't believe that this was a cancer. And ultimately, I still did my due diligence and followed things through. But when it was diagnosed as a cancer, I said, this is interesting because this was something that was ingrained in me. And it's like, okay, so something I was taught doesn't necessarily have to be true. Then that same woman asked me, did it matter what she ate? And I said, I don't think so because no one ever told me that it did, but just ask your oncologist to be sure. She did that and the oncologist said, it doesn't matter, um, just keep your weight up. And so if you start losing weight, go to Dunkin' Donuts and just eat donuts. And she asked me if I thought that that made sense. And I said, again, I'm not an expert. I don't know. And I said, that sounds like a lot of sugar. And I don't know if there's a relationship with sugar and cancer. And the patient told me, well, my nutritionist said sugar is really bad if you had cancer. And I said, well, that can't be true. Because I certainly would have been told about that. And then I went to do some research on that, and I found over 5,000 articles on sugar and cancer. And I remember my reaction, my visceral reaction, when the librarian told me there were over 5,000 articles. This feeling went through me, through my physical body, this physical sensation almost got a little bit weak. And it was like, I can't believe this. There's something going on with the medical establishment where not all the information is being transferred. And I started looking at other things, learning about nutrition, and then found my way to Jeff Bland and functional medicine, and here I am. Jeff Bland, the gateway drug to functional medicine. Exactly. <laughs> <clears throat> um, so I love that story so much. I've heard you tell it before. And it's the reason why I ask many people now about their, um, yeah. it's had a really profound impact on me. It's so fascinating. Um, so thank you for sharing that with us. And today we're gonna to be talking about something that, so, and <clears throat> the whole sugar cancer connection is something that is still not, be, in conventional medicine, it's still not being conveyed. That The advice is still there that if you are undergoing cancer treatment in order to keep your weight up, um, you know, eat Snickers bars, eat ice cream, you know, just eat whatever calorie laden junk you want to keep your weight up. So the, the idea about sugar and cancer being related is still considered in some circles as being a little bit controversial, which is a little bit crazy to those of us who have Yes, yes. Now we can talk more about that if you like. I have a lot to say on that. <laughs> but the reason that I even mentioned that is because, of course, we're going to be talking today about something that is equally a little bit controversial between the functional and conventional systems, which is food intolerance testing and food inflammatory reactions. And, um, you know, traditionally, uh, we are, well, tr in the traditional way of thinking, we're taught that there is allergy and then there is uh, intolerance, so things like fructose intolerance and lactose intolerance, which is, um, you know, a, di a malfunction of the digestive system, yeah. mostly, yeah. you know, enzyme kind of mediated. And that's it, that anything else is considered kind of intangible or, you know, quackery on the, on the extreme end of that scale. So, um, 
sh you know, shady is a word that's used here in the UK, you know, for, for IgG testing particularly. So, um, so I would kind of like to open with that because of course we've actually, we have been using here in the UK particularly, we've been using IgG testing um, to help us and um, identify foods that might be causing a problem with people. But of course there is some, um, there's some downside to the IgG testing that we've been using uh, in that they're not necessarily considered to be reproducible necessarily, or they're not necessarily indicative of you know, inflammation that's going on in the body. Um, so can you elaborate on that a little bit more? The, um, the, the, the idea that um, IgG is related to food reactivity and how, how KBMO, particularly this FIT test, differs from what we've had before and why um, you and I consider it to be, you know, the, the sort of gold standard in, in food reactivity testing. Sure, sure. So, you know, what you just said really typifies the conventional medical perspective on food sensitivity testing. That's what I was going for. <laughs> so, you know, there are food reactions that people have, but, you know, as you said, sugar, MSG, lactose, etc. And then there are some uh, reactions that everybody has. So if you were to eat a toxin, for example, from a mushroom, um, a wild mushroom, everybody would have that reaction. So pretty much um, conventional medicine is fine with that type of reaction. What they're not okay with is an immune reaction to food that's not IgE mediated. So medicine is fine about IgE, and IgE, immunoglobulin E, is that part of the immune system that causes hypersensitivity reaction and anaphylactic shock. So we all know about children with peanut allergy that can come close to death by eating peanuts, and that's why we can't have peanuts on a flight if there's somebody with a severe peanut allergy. So that's what we're not talking about. We're talking about the foods that people eat that drive chronic illness, and they may not be aware of it. And sometimes they are aware, but most of the time they're not. So symptoms from food sensitivities are really the tip of the iceberg. The bigger part of the iceberg, the bigger way food sensitivities cause problems in people are without giving symptoms. And what happens here is that foods, as they go through the digestive tract, and we have to think about the digestive tract as a tube. And as the foods go through the tube, they are exposed to the walls of the intestinal tract. And the walls of the small intestine are primarily lined by the immune system. So the biggest immune organ of the body lies in the gut. And we are very selective about what we allow into our body because the way the body views this digestive tube is that it's part of the external environment because what goes in, if we don't want it to come into the body, it then comes out of the body. So it's really the external environment. So we have to be very careful about what we allow into our bloodstream. And that selective process is guarded by tight junctions between the cells. So the cells are very, very tightly bound together to keep a barrier so that we don't allow things in that we don't want to come in. We're very selective. And then when we find things that we want to bring in, so we've broken down our food properly into small fragments as opposed to large fragments. So those, full, those small fragments can either go through the cell, which is a transcellular pathway, or in between the cells, which is a paracellular pathway. If they're going between the cells, it's because the cells open up a little bit to allow those fragments to go through that's caused by a protein called zonulin. If, however, there are issues like inflammation, too much bacteria, too much zonulin release, then those tight junctions are no longer so tight and they separate and then 
poorly digested or undigested proteins come in, and that's far into the immune system. And so antibodies are created, especially because they're foreign proteins. We expect things to be digested into small fatlets. The other reason that we might make antibodies is if we have a lipopolysaccharide, for example, something that comes from a bacterial cell membrane, which we are appropriately create an antibody response to, but it just may happen that the molecular sequence on that lipopolysaccharide is the exact same one as on a food. And so that is a random occurrence, but because we make antibodies to that bacteria, we then have antibodies to the food. And what happens then is when we have antibodies to a food, whenever we ingest that food, we will create an inflammatory response. That's the theory behind food sensitivity. Now, just to finish, the reason that conventional medicine has issues with that is because the way to identify and test these antibodies is not very accurate at all. So you have people that go for testing with labs that aren't registered or certified. And the technology is such that they'll test 250 foods or 300 foods, and people will be allergic to a, or sensitive to 100 foods. And what do you do with those results? So that's the, re it's also not very reproducible, for example, either through split sample testing or same testing consecutively um, a week or two later. And so that's why there's a problem. But IgG testing is used in some circumstances in conventional medicine, is it not? Well, IgG testing is used in conventional medicine, but not for food sensitivity testing. Mm -hmm. It's really can be a test of immune health. Mm -hmm. okay. <clears throat> so, can you talk a little bit more about why, why straight IgG antibody testing might not be as accurate as we need it to be and how fit test differs? You know, what is it that made it stand out to you? Right, so, so for the reasons I just described, um, I always looked at food sensitivity testing as the Wild West mm -hmm. because I could never find the right lab and there were different ways that uh, tests were done. But I knew inherently that if you ate foods that your immune system didn't like, it was gonna cause a problem. Mm -hmm. And because we eat three times a day, this could potentially be one of the biggest triggers of chronic complex illness. And as a functional medicine educator, I'm aware of the importance of identifying the root causes or underlying causes of chronic illness. So ignoring the contribution of foods was, would be wrong. Now, the way functional medicine looks at this is to say, well, let's do an elimination diet, which means let's eliminate foods that most people are sensitive to and then reintroduce and see if symptoms develop or recur. And I think that that's a great start, especially for people that don't have access to or can't afford laboratory testing. The problem with that approach is that I said, symptoms are only a small piece of the food reactions that people have. So you won't get enough information just from the elimination diet even though the information you get is good, because if you find out that you reintroduce dairy, you get a headache or your sinuses fill up, yeah, you should avoid dairy. But that's just a small piece of the information that we could get about the importance of food and illness. Mm -hmm. So what I found about this test, and this was through a random visit to a booth at a symposium, was that this is a test that measures inflammation. Now, it happens to actually be called the food inflammation test. And so what this test does 
is it is designed to narrowly focus on the foods that drive inflammation as opposed to foods that may have an IgG response. Mm -hmm. So foods that alone create an IgG response may or may not be a problem because if the IgG response doesn't progress to the next step, which is inflammation, in my mind, it's not clinically significant. In fact, there's literature out there that says that it's normal to make some IgG with food. So I don't consider that to be important, which is why I never did any of the testing. But when I found that this test identifies foods that cause inflammation, I was really excited and really interested because we all know that inflammation is a major driver for chronic illness. Yes. So if we could identify the foods that cause inflammation, I, I mean, this is to me, was like part of the Holy Grail, right? I'm like, this is too good to be true. <laughs> And so I dug a little deeper and I found out, you know, how this works. So um, inflammation happens through the complement cascade. Mm -hmm. And so IgG binds to or connects with complement. And so you can have IgG from foods, but unless complement binds to that immunoglobulin molecule, there will be no inflammatory cascade. So what this test looks for is not just IgG alone, but IgG bound to complement. Right. And so by identifying those foods, we know these are the foods that cause inflammation. And that means that number one, yes, you have to avoid them, but what it means is that the results we get are much fewer positives than with the other, the other tests. Mm -hmm. So it's something that's doable. Right. So our average number is anywhere between five and nine foods, right. which is so it's certainly doable. Yeah. Um, so it's really it's just taking it that step further and identifying not just the IgG reaction, but here is a food um, that is triggering inflammation in the body. It's really the test itself is that extra step of information. Um, and that narrows it down from foods that the gut has been exposed to, to foods that are triggering inflammation in the systemic circulation. Absolutely. Okay. And um, apart from specific food reactivity, is there any other information that we can glean from the test results? Yeah, so we can also tell if there is a diagnosis of leaky gut. Mm -hmm. So we can make a diagnosis of leaky gut in three ways with this test. Mm -hmm. The first is if you see a high number of food sensitivities. So if you see more than seven or eight sensitivities, it means that there's leaky gut. And that's because your body has had a chance to react to too many foods so that the foods that go down the tube end up triggering your immune system. The second way is that one of the things we test for is candida. Mm -hmm. And we test for candida specifically for the purpose of identifying like leaky gut or diagnosing leaky gut. Right. Everyone, we all have a little bit of candida in our intestinal tract. Mm -hmm. But if these tight junctions are open, that candida that lines the intestine will seep through and trigger an immune response. So if you have an immune response to candida, it happened because of leaky gut. And the third way is we now offer a zonulin test. Mm -hmm. And so if zonulin is elevated, remember zonulin is the protein that opens these tight junctions. And if that's elevated, we also have leaky gut. Great, so it's two tests in one really. But, uh, exactly. It's the need of running a second intestinal permeability panel. Um, oh, absolutely. Yeah. And so, you know, you're, you're in clinical practice, you have a big, busy practice. Who are you choosing to run this test on within your practice? So, since we know that this test identifies foods that cause inflammation, I really should be offering this test to every patient I see, which I do just for those reasons. And that can be the spectrum of the very 
healthy client that comes in for optimal wellness, an elite athlete, certainly athletes want to know anything that can impede their performance mm -hmm. and eating foods that drive inflammation will impede their performance. So that's one spectrum. And then the other spectrum is someone that has real serious illness. And the reasons are obvious for that. Now there's really good literature on the role of food sensitivity and the role of leaky gut in all sorts of clinical issues. So whether it's migraines, whether it's IBS, whether it's IBD, whether it's metabolic syndrome, whether it's cancer, breast cancer, colon cancer, patients after chemotherapy, pregnancy-related cases, so inflammation leading to preeclampsia, premature labor, whether it's miscarriage and increasing pregnancy loss. So there's all sorts of reasons to do this test. I found that really fascinating, actually, the, um, the connection between uh, food uh, food react or food related inflammation and increased risk of first trimester loss. Yes, yes. And uh, another, so another thing that I asked you about that I would like to talk about, of course, is breastfeeding mothers um, of an infant who has um, the myriad of things that go wrong with infants: eczema, colic, um, you know, reflux. Um, do you utilize food sensitivity testing on the mother in that instance? And can we talk a little bit about, um, you know, transferred immunity and, and how the infant's immune system and breast milk relates? Sure, sure. So um, there's so many ways to look at designing the optimal approach for, and I use the, the mother baby unit as one unit, the diet, it's really one unit. Um, when you're struggling with, with an infant that has these particular issues that you talk about. And a lot of that has to do with a problem with the immune system of the baby. There are these atopic types of changes of, you know, pediatric asthma, eczema, the dark eyes, the colic, the difficulty sleeping, the difficulty soothing, um, that's you know something that's that's very very common and there are lots of of reasons for this and if we were to sort of do a list and what this is one of the things that we'll be talking about in the gestational summit just to give that a little bit of a plug um but the importance of breastfeeding but also as we're breastfeeding and i know this strays from this particular topic about food but just some serenity, a sense of peace, a sense of connection at the time of breastfeeding and as hard as it is when we're trying to comfort that baby because that makes a difference and, in, and impacts the energetics transfer. And so you're just doing a little, a little bit um, to help the baby. As far as your direct question about foods, um, there, the baby's microbiome is impacted not only at birth but actually while the baby's in utero and so the importance of a healthy microbiome is critical and that drives a lot of the or an abnormal or a healthy microbiome drives a lot of these atopic changes in the baby as well as as colic and so Breastfeeding is so important because if you're bottle feeding, um, that changes the microbiome. Being born by cesarean section can give the baby a little bit of a lag start to a, to a healthy gut and a healthy immune system. But specifically with foods and breast milk, so anything that the mom eats or anything that's in the maternal circulation will transfer through to breast milk. It's not like the placenta where things are really selective in what gets transferred and what doesn't. So it pretty much almost everything gets transferred, including pro-inflammatory cytokines and food fragments. And so when moms eat foods that 
disturb the baby, the baby gets disturbed. And so the role of this testing is critical in that situation because you don't want to give pro-inflammatory chemicals to a baby that's already upregulated. And when the baby's upregulated, like you described, a smaller amount of pro-inflammatory chemicals will create an inflammatory cascade and create comfort, discomfort than a baby that isn't upregulated. So I, one of my own observations from clinical practice has been that when a mother has a baby and, you know, they go through all kinds of immune changes and, and things like that. But when a mother has a baby, uh, sometimes the baby's reaction to breast milk is the first sign, the first tangible symptom that the mother has a, an inflammatory problem with a food. So let's just call that dairy, for example. Like the yes. baby seems to amplify uh, the problem that the mother has silently in, in her body. Yes, yes, yes. So if we could um, design a test where we could get breast milk from everybody and put a, their newborn there, we wouldn't need to do KVMO. <laughs> <laughs> Except to find out which the offending foods are, I guess. Right, right. <laughs> um, so could you just explain a little bit more about the relationship with sugar um, and how sugar factors into uh, food reactivity? Because it, it's not the same as um, as a, a reaction to dairy or gluten, for example, is it? It's not, but it's, it's interesting. So sugar causes problems so many ways. And I think that, you know, it's very easy to say everybody should avoid as much sugar as they can. And that happens to be a true statement. And the reason, <laughs> um, and the reason it's a true statement is because sugar you know, causes problems. And people will say, well, in moderation, you know, sugar is probably okay, especially if it's, you know, comes from fruit um, and you're not having a lot. And I'd say, okay, you know what? If it doesn't cause a problem for you, um, you know, small amounts of fruit are probably okay, especially berries mm -hmm. um, and apples, I think particularly good as well. But I, I think that, you know, sugar can be a problem. And you know, our, our immunoglobulins, our IgG, you know, there's types of immunoglobulins, specifically IgG two through four, which are actually reactive to disaccharides or starches, um, which ultimately become sugar. So um, we are almost like pre-programmed um, to potentially have immune reactions even though it's not a classic food sensitivity that activates complement. So when people have sugar, um, everyone reacts differently. And that's where an elimination diet actually is very helpful. So seeing how you react after you avoid sugar. So I would say avoid sugar for 21 days. And that's really not only added sugar, but foods that contain any type of sugar in recipes, in ingredients, um, avoid it for 21 days. And when you slowly add it back, people notice one of two categories of reactions, stuff that's gastrointestinal or digestion related or systemic mm -hmm. headaches, um, change in mood, fatigue, etc. And so that's how you know that sugar isn't for you. Okay. Okay. And that has nothing to do with the problems with insulin um, that we all know about. Manifold with sugar. Right. You know, that's not even the psycho-emotional relationship with food and sugar right. being addictive and you know lighting up the multi regions in the brain worse right. than pain. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah, <clears throat> actually, as you know, lights up those dopamine receptors, which are the same receptors from, you know, heroin, cocaine, and other narcotics. So um, it's quite addicting. Yeah, um, <clears throat> and I think the elimination diet is a really good opportunity to reset, or not even necessarily reset, but identify in the first place, not just inflammatory reactions to foods such as sugar that you might be having, but also your emotional relationship with food and how you use food in your life and sugar um, 
you know, in ways that are maybe less healthy for you. Right, right. And I, and I just actually finished one. Um, Elimination and, time. Yeah, and, and what I notice, and I notice it every time, but it's still like a new thing for me. And I'm like, wow, I'm noticing this. And <laughs> I tell my friends, and like, that's what you said last time. <laughs> <laughs> but what I notice every time is the difference between true hunger and just wanting to eat. Mm -hmm and wanting certain foods in my mouth and et cetera. Mm -hmm. And that's such an important lesson, I think, for all of us mm -hmm. um, to be able to identify those two different feelings. Yeah, you know, there's lots of ways that food promotes health and also that food promotes less healthy patterns yeah. in the body. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, outside of just straight uh, immune reactivity. Right, right. So in your practice, are you, are you also using elimination diet or are you primarily just using, you know, do you incorporate the two? Do you think that there's place for that? Um, for convenience, do you just use, um, you know, the food, in, food inflammation test or does it depend on the patient? Do you sort of... I think that's a great, great question. And so this is what I do in my practice. Um, so it starts with the intake. And what are the symptoms and or diagnoses that somebody has, as well as what are their goals? And I will usually start with the food sensitivity test because, as you know, the elimination diet eliminates a lot of foods. Mm -hmm. And the food sensitivity test, on average, will eliminate, you know, five to nine. Mm -hmm. So I find it's easier for compliance to start with the food sensitivity test. Then I see after we're done, what's happening with symptoms. And if symptoms aren't better, that's the time for an elimination diet. I will start with an elimination diet, however, if someone says that the food sensitivity testing is something they don't want to do either because of a belief or because of financial reasons. Is it a blood draw? It's a finger stick or a blood draw. So if you're sending a patient for other blood work, you can add this on and it'll just be a blood draw. And if you're in the office or you're not a physician, um, you can, it's just a finger stick. Right, very, very convenient. Um, so I've just got a question that has come in from one of the attendees, which is this. Um, if zonulin is high, how do you know if inflammation is driven purely by intestinal permeability rather than a food sensitivity? Would the high zonulin not skew the results? Do you think that comes back to the complement? Well, it's also, I mean, it's a little bit of a mishmash. So it's a little bit of everything. So when you have high zonulin and you have food sensitivities, you're dealing with two separate issues that have a common underlying cause. So what happens is that the food sensitivities cause inflammation, that inflammation itself can widen those tight junctions and lead to more food sensitivities because the, um, the reaction of the food sensitivity actually creates antibodies that attack the proteins that keep the, tight, the junctions tight between the cells. So you create antibodies to the proteins that connect those cells and keep them close just from food sensitivity and inflammation. So that then creates some leaky gut. And then you have zonulin that can be secreted, which is secreted with localized inflammation in the gut. And that creates wider junctions, which leads to more food sensitivity and more zonulin. So it's a very interconnected web. The chicken or the egg, what came first, we'll never really know, but we know to address both. So it's a self-perpetuating cycle at a certain point. Exactly. Um, so I just wanted to throw a final call for questions um, out to the audience, if anybody has any uh, last burning things that they're dying to ask or hear. <clears throat> 
And while we're waiting for that, I'm going to give another little plug for the gestational summit <laughs> because that's coming up in October. So um, one of the things that I didn't mention in the, oh, okay, I'll come to that at the end. One of the things that I didn't mention in your introduction um, is that you actually gave a really fascinating speech to the United Nations on the topic of prenatal, the prenatal origins of violence. Um, and that you serve as the United Nations representative for the World Organization of Prenatal Education Associations. Is that correct? That's correct. So when I originally had the idea that turned into the Gestational Journey Summit um, that we're hosting here in London in October, you know, it was germinated around the twin stimuli of my experience of pregnancy and um, my frustrations around available information around pregnancy. Um, and your speaking, you know, I listened to that, um, to your speech to the United Nations when I was pregnant with my first daughter. Right, that's right. So that's, that was sort of the, the conception of the idea, if you like. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you and I are the parents I of the I love that. I love that. And so, of course, I've asked you to present because, you know, I couldn't really imagine anybody else giving that that speech. Um, and you're going to be talking about prenatal priming and how the nine months in the womb shapes pretty much everything in some way about the rest of your life. And I think that it's so important that even if you don't specialize in fertility or you don't specialize in women's health, um, you are at some point going to have somebody in your practice who falls pregnant and who wants to continue um, uh, during the time that you, you know, can continue working with you during the time that they are pregnant. Um, so even if you're not specialising, I'm talking to the audience here, not to mm -hmm. me specifically, but uh, even if you're not specialising fertility or women's health or hormones, I think it's so important to come um, to the summits uh, because you need to hear the information that's being presented so that you can support that one person um, instead of trying to find that information at that time. Um, so we're almost, so four months out from the summit, we're already, um, we've sold half of the tickets. So I, I Oh, wow, that's wonderful. Uh, so I get the strong impression that it's going to sell out actually very quickly. So for those of you who are on the fence about it, I would snap up your tickets um, ASAP before they are sold out because we are limited to 200. So once we get to that number, um, you know, we can't really extend it any further than that. Unfortunately, it's going to be a brilliant event. I would actually go on record, and I'm sorry for AFMCP because you're speaking at that the weekend before. I'm going to go out and say that I actually think that the gestational journey is going to be the biggest event in the UK this year. Um, you know, we've got a really sensational lineup of speakers. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. So the final question for today is, uh, is there an association between H. pylori infection and heightened IgG immune response? Well, I think there's um, a little bit of a difference there. So H. pylori infection will create an immune response because it's an infection, but it's not going to impact food sensitivity. So it's separate in that way. And I think it's important that we understand that they're separate so that when you have patients that come in with upper abdominal symptoms, that we do an H. pylori test. Mm -hmm. And how, how are you, to, this is not related to KBMO obviously, but since you're here and we're talking about H. pylori mm -hmm. and I'm gonna pick your brain. In your clinical practice, how do you test for H. pylori? Are you looking breath in test. stool? Yeah. Are you looking in breath? Yeah, I do the breath test, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, and, uh, my, so my other question about H. pylori is, do you consider H. pylori to be commensal uh, in some people and problematic in others? Or do you think that if it's there, it needs to be addressed? Or does somebody need to be symptomatic? Yeah, that's, I think people need to be symptomatic, absolutely. So that's one of the reasons I don't do it on everybody. Mm -hmm. so I only do it with symptoms. But if you have symptoms, I think it needs to be uh, addressed. Now what's interesting, it's funny you bring this up, but the pendulum with peptic ulcer disease is really um, an interesting one to observe. So if you remember, peptic ulcer disease was always thought to be a stress-related phenomenon. Mm -hmm. We had Hans Selye's work and he looked at rats that were stressed and they found ulcers. Mm -hmm. And then we discovered H. pylori and we thought it was all H. pylori. 
Now, I just saw an article this past week that it's not just H. pylori, it's also stress. Mm -hmm. And it's like, and again, this is not my area, you know, peptic ulcer disease, I'm not a researcher there. But some researcher, some researcher said, I wonder if the H. pylori makes people more sensitive to stress. <laughs> and I'm like, really? It took you guys 50 years to figure this out? Like, that's what I've been saying to my patients all along. But now we've got the references in the conventional literature that's saying it's really uh, a combination of both. So if only we could get people to read the literature and update yeah. them. But don't you don't you think it's interesting? I can't remember the um, the man's name now. I think he was actually in Australia, but uh, you know he drank the H pylori in order to prove his hypothesis that H right. pylori was the problem, and in fact did um, use that as proof because did go on to get an ulcer. But I think that it makes sense to me thinking about things from a systems biology perspective that it's usually the result of. Um, the infectious agent and something that has something changed else. the environment, right? Right. And stress is one of the biggest things. And think about that the, the man whose name I can't remember, how much stress he must have been under with everybody telling him he was wrong and, mm. you know, um, he was so determined to prove this thing. Like, he must have been an incredibly stressed individual. All and also, how much H. pylori he took in. <laughs> yeah, also. <laughs> incredible load. full of it, yeah. Right. Okay, we are at the end of our allotted time, unfortunately, because I could really spend the next three hours I'd love to, yes, all yes. of the different things with you. So I just wanted to say a great big thank you for your time and your expertise, and it's been really interesting um, talking through this panel with you. Uh, you know, in the beginning, I confess that when I heard that there was another IgG panel coming out, I thought, why? Why has anybody done this? We're, sat we're so saturated in the market. And then when I learned about KBMO, I thought, no, this is really different. It's really exciting. And it really is different than the other tests that are out there. And so I'm super happy to be teaching people. Oh, that's wonderful. Today. That's thank wonderful. you very much. Well, thank you. And thank you to all our viewers. And we will see you here in October. Absolutely. Okay. Thanks very much, Dr. Evans. And um, enjoy the rest of your day, all of our viewers at home. Thank you very much. Thank you.